Good day, Las Vegas, and welcome back to Vegas Vibes, giving you a peek at what's grooving and ruined in the music, pageantry, live production, and fascinating scenes in the city that never sleeps. And I'm your host, Esmeralda Padilla Gould. I'm so excited to share with you that today's episode is the first one for the 10th season. Gosh, it seems like yesterday only when I reluctantly agreed to host Vegas Vibes. Only because I was so shy and timid, very nervous, especially in front of high-definition cameras. Fast forward three years later, I'm still nervous, but no longer as shy. The best part about my job is that I get to meet amazing people every week, especially those who are successful in their respective industry, yet willing to help people who are just starting out in the business, just like myself. I'm blessed to have a team who patiently works with me and take me to the right path. I also would like to thank the hundreds of thousands of loyal viewers of Vegas Vibes on Vegas Live TV, ACTV, WCTV, and BenchNetworks.tv, especially those watching on my favorite devices, Roku, Kodi, Amazon Fire TV, Samsung and LG Smart TVs, and their recently added Pizzas.tv. And of course, in my very own website, VegasVibes.us. Please continue to support my show as well as my Vegas Vibes Network by telling your friends to like Vegas Vibes on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. I also would like to thank the millions of visitors who came to Vegas this month as we continue to celebrate the Vegas Vibes moment that Las Vegas is fully but cautiously open. We continue to encourage all locals and visitors to be more responsible in dealing with the extension of the pandemic so we can all reap the benefits of a safer and peaceful community. We hope to continue seeing familiar faces when we watch mega concerts and major sports events live and in person, even with our mask on. When Vegas Vice returns, I will be interviewing Deborah Alexander. Remember her? She's the wife of Big Frank Alexander, the bodyguard of murdered R&B star and rapper Tupac Shakur. I interviewed her early this year about why her husband killed himself and why she has decided to tell her story to the world and even writing a book about it. Well, her book is now done, published and available in the market. So we have decided to make a follow-up story. More juicy details will come out during this interview, so don't go away. Welcome back. Las Vegas remains to host the best and the biggest resorts in the globe, and some of the best entertainers in the world live right here in this great city. It's bursting in the seams with creative juices, and those mega live productions can't forever be parked in the shade. So keep coming to Vegas. There's danger everywhere, even in your own closet. So keep coming, but be vigilant and careful all the time, even if you're fully vaccinated. When you see a particular show or your live event you like, book it without delay as tickets will come and go super fast. You snooze, you lose, so be on the lookout always. In a few moments, I will be joined by Deborah Alexander, who recently has published a book entitled The Private Life of Big Frank. My interview of Deborah coming up next, so freeze that remote until Vegas Vibes returns. Welcome back to Vegas Vibes. On Vegas Vibes, we feature amazingly talented people from many walks of life who contribute to making our world a better place by getting involved with their communities and the many other incredible things that they do. And on that note, here with us today is the widow of Frank Alexander, the former bodyguard of the late rap star Tupac Shakur. On April 28, 2013, Frank Alexander sadly took his own life. This dramatic event was witnessed by Deborah and she's back on Vegas Vibes to talk about the book she has recently published, The Private Life of Big Frank. 
and her journey living with grief and post-traumatic stress disorder. Welcome back to Vegas Lives, Ms. Deborah Alexander. Thank you for having me back. I appreciate that. How have you been since our last interview in March? Um, I've been okay. I've been, um, I've been uh, working on getting my book out there and getting it promoted and um, um, working with uh, mental health people with the mental health and suicide and um, just, uh, just, just looking forward to the future, you know? Please describe or bring us back to that um, uneventful thing that happened in 2013 when your beloved husband sadly took his own life right in front of you, something that truly changed your life forever. Oh, totally changed my life forever. And a million years did I ever expect my husband to do that. Um, he had went to the movies all day and um, he uh, came home and when he came home I was extremely happy to see him just like a little girl whose daddy got home and um, he just uh, was sort of didn't say very much just walked into the house went into his office and his office that had all the Tupac um, he had all his Tupac pictures and Memorabilia. everything all his yeah yeah and he um, he uh, got into his gun safe and I was like, you know, I was just talking to him. I didn't think anything of it. He always messed around with his guns. It was no big deal. Just that's who he was. And um, so he um, got into his gun safe. He got um, his uh, gun out that he got from the Marine Corps when he was uh, discharged. And it was a, a Beretta. Um, and uh, I think it was a Beretta uh, 40 caliber and um, he actually pointed the gun at me first but in my conversation with him never once expected that he would I didn't even even dawn on me any of that he would was going to do anything and then um, and, and then um, he uh, smelt the gun put the gun to his head and um, he went bang he said the word bang um, I, um, I uh, ran out of the room. Um, I thought he was messing around. I really didn't think he, he would do something like that because he loved himself. Um, so I um, ran back into the room and um, I asked him to get up, but I smelled gunpowder and just, I knew then, he, he took his life, he shot himself. So I went and grabbed the phone and ran out the house, I dialed 911. Um, I told him he shot himself, but I couldn't remember, I don't remember a whole lot after all of that because I did get PTSD. Um, the body has a way of protecting itself when it, um, it sees something that it's not supposed to see, I guess. Um, I can't remember um, the blood. I can't remember his head was um, really messed up bad. He used a hollow point. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that I still can't remember. And it's been eight years. Wow. This is the second time I'm hearing it from you, but I could still feel the heaviness of what you went through. So please tell us, um, did you get any professional support or professional help? I did. I did. But well, first I went to suicide meetings to kind of understand why would someone, you can't understand why would someone that you love, that has everything, why would they do that? And so um, I, I, I couldn't understand why he would, um, would want to kill himself. And so I um, went to suicide meetings. It was a very sad time in my life. Um, the suicide meetings were not good. Um, there were a lot of young kids that had taken their lives and there were a lot of parents in there. And um, mine was the only one that I actually saw my husband do it. Um, they had found their children, but nevertheless, it doesn't make it any easier. It, everyone struggles with that, that pain that you, when you lose somebody like that with no answers. Um, so I went to suicide meetings, I went to counseling, I went to psychiatrists, I took medication, um, I got hypnotized, um, I went to a media, um, 
I, I mean, of course, I've always prayed to God. And um, so those were some of the things that, and I, had, of course, had family and people that loved me and supported me. So I was very blessed uh, um, in a lot of ways, you know, that, um, you know, he didn't take my life, you know. I'm still here, maybe I'm here to help people, help people. Have you found the clarity why it has all happened to you? Do you even question God why you? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, you know, I never once blamed God for what happened. Um, um, you know, God has a reason. The reason why I'm still here is um, it's going to be magnificent. I'm going to help people who struggle with PTSD, suicide, and other things that my book discuss or talks about. Um, so I, I feel that, you know, I'm supposed to be here, you know? I'm supposed to be here, you know? So how is, are you saying you have found your purpose? My purpose, I think my purpose is to help people who struggle with that demon, PTSD. And uh, I believe my husband had PTSD. Um, the reason I say so is because he used to always say, I'll mourn him till I join him. He, he met Tupac. He, he lived with an incredible amount of guilt after Tupac died because he was told to drive behind the car that day, not in the car. Now you realize if he had driven in the car that day, his life he would have been wouldn't have been alive to yes. tell his story. Mm -hmm. But he was spared, so God spared him for those 13 years that I had him in my life. Um, so, um, yeah, um, I'm here to help help people who who need help in that. You mentioned that the tragic event changed your life forever. How did it change your personality? You said uh, before you, did, yeah. you had a couple of tattoos, and after your husband passed away, you, you did a lot of things that you never imagined you could do for yourself. This is true. Um, when my husband was alive, I had this tattoo that said faith and my wedding tattoo. Now I have all of these tattoos, these tattoos, and tattoos some here. And let me tell you why I got tattoos. I was in so much pain that they all have a reason and a purpose and an answer and they mean something they all mean something um, but I got tattoos because the pain in me was so deep that I had to when when they would and I would do them on anniversaries like wedding anniversaries and and a death anniversary and his and his birthday I would do them on those times so I would just feel the pain here and it would just it would make me so tired after I would get this tattoo done that I would just have to rest. It was like therapy for me. A therapy yeah. and a sort of escape. Yeah. And so I can understand why people do that, you know. It's, it's like an escape therapy. And I don't regret any of them. I like them all. Talking about regrets, what are your fears and regrets? Regrets. If there's anything that you could have changed with what happened, you know, what would it be? I do have one regret. And, um, well, I don't know if it's, it's a regret. Um, probably it was like um, a couple months or less prior to Frankie taking his life. He had done that bef prior to that time. And he said, let's die together. He had his Glock. And I thought, you're crazy. Why would you want to do that? And I ran out of the room. Well, I didn't say nothing because I was afraid of him. I was afraid his livelihood was um, bodyguarding and security and it all had guns. It had to have a gun and he had um, CCWs in every single state and um, if I were to tell the, call the police and say you know we need to take those guns away yes. from him mm -hmm. that wouldn't have been a good thing. And so I never said anything about it in um, my, my story ends tragically because of that. And perhaps it wouldn't have been any different. Um, I do know the officer said to me after he had did what he did that he would have done that anyways because he had been thinking about it. And so it would be something that he would have uh, 
uh, I would have found him somewhere or he would have went somewhere. And so um, I don't know. I can't answer for him or think for him. I don't know what was going through his head that day. Did you ever contemplate it? Or have you ever contem contemplated suicide? I have. And how did you cope? How, did you, how are you surviving? Well, you know, I know what it did. I know what it did to me and what it did to people around me when Brinky did what he did. Um, but there is, I can understand when there is a pain so deep inside of someone that um, the only way out is to end it. To end it. Um, because I struggle with that pain inside of me. Um, um, I'm learning to channel it in different ways to help other people um, who struggle with that be there for someone else. Um, he, um, I would never do that to myself. I have thought about it, and, but I would never do that because it, it hurts a lot of people. And it's not a selfish thing, I don't think. I don't think when my husband did what he did, it was a selfish thing. I don't think at all it was selfish. I think it took a lot of courage for him to hold that gun to his head and do what he did. Um, but um, because, you know, it, unbelievable things people say to you when someone does that mm -hmm. to themselves, you know, unbelievable. So, so what keeps you going? How, how do you get up every day and and live your life normally. I know it can be very Well, my life isn't really normally like it used to be normally. Um, it's different now. Um, I lost love for a lot of things in my life, and I'm looking to look for love again. So, you know, love is very important. Um, I used to love riding horses. That's, we had a ranch. And when Frankie died, I stopped. And so that's an, a goal in me, is to, to start riding again, um, get a horse. Um, I have animals. Um, I have uh, hairless cats, um, spinks, and I have my, my big um, mastiff. And so um, they, uh, they make me get up in the morning because they need me. They need me to take care of them and put them out and feed them and love them. Speaking of love, are you ready, or when are you, do you know when you're ready, or do you feel you're, that you're ready to open your heart again and fall in love and be happy? You know, I think if, uh, if, if, if the right person would come into my life and they would understand me for what I have been through and, um, and love me for who I am because I've changed, um, perhaps you know, that would be one step at a time. Yeah, I would, I would be, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say no, I'm never gonna love again. No, because I want love. It's, it, I would like another best friend, absolutely. I would love a best friend. So what do you do to find happiness, like in your daily life? Well, right now I really work out, as you could tell. Um, I like the gym, the gym keeps me, keeps me focused. Um, I, um, I um, have friends that you know I, I spend time with. Um, like I'm looking right now to see about making my book into a movie. Um, so that's something I'm really focusing on. Um, just trying to just keep myself busy. What's hard for me is the nights um, because I get insomnia, and so um, the night is quiet. It's when during the day I can cope pretty much because I could be around people and talk to people. But it's the night that is uh, haunting to me. And so I have to take medication. Uh, I take trazodone for my, um, my night to kind of settle me down to help me rest because of my insomnia. Because for many years, I didn't want to fall asleep because I would have nightmares. Yes, what triggers your PS PTSD? It's certain smells. Um, um, oh, from the gunpowder. Oh, yeah, certain smells. Um, I, um, if I see a police officer on a motorcycle riding next to me in the car, sometimes I have to pull over because I see the gun, I remember what happened, and it, it like, it's like a movie in my head. It just plays. It's like a movie. It's, it's crazy. I could, it's just like a movie. 
And so um, I um, um, certain smell, like I could be in a crowd and I could smell a man who's wearing the kind of cologne Frank would wear, like Boss or something. And I like instantly, I see him, I see his vision, I see how he wore his hair, I see how big he was, I, I just see him. And sometimes I catch myself even saying things like he would say, and I would feel like he's behind me talking, you know? Like he's saying, uh, I'm blessed. And I could hear him say, oh, that was coming from Frank. He just came through me. Let's talk about your book. Okay. What can people um, learn from your, your experience? Through your um, lens. My story tells about my 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 story is about my journey with my husband. It talks about um, our love story as we met and uh, and our adventure and as we got our ranch and and and, and it also talks about our struggles, um, about our financial struggles. It talks about our um, personal struggles. It talks about um, infidelity. It talks it, it it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. It's like an onion, but it's true but at the end of the day when it's all done i still loved him and it was you know even though he did what he did you know i still loved him what do you value from this experience um i value not to take one minute for granted don't ever take one minute for granted and always always give a helping hand to someone who needs it um before i would not pay too much attention to that but now i'm very very sensitive to people that need help that are struggling, that are, you know, out there homeless and hungry, because um, it, it changed the way I look at things. It's just the value of life, because you realize it takes only one second. It took him not even, I mean, he kept his eyes open for 10 seconds. I stood there and watched his eyes close for 10 seconds, and then he crumbled. He crumbled. and. I didn't realize he was here, he was gone. Now I can't text him anymore. I can't call him anymore. I can't say goodnight to him anymore. I can't tell him I love him anymore. He's gone forever. So what I would say to everyone out there, don't ever take one minute for granted to the people you love. Always, always listen and be there for them. That's what I would say. Miss Deborah, please invite everyone. Where can they get a copy of your book? Um, you can get a copy of my book at um, www.theprivatelifeofbigfrank.com. Uh, of That is my personal website. And then you can also go to um, Amazon, uh, The Private Life of Big Frank. It's also on, um, it's also on iTunes and it's in um, Barnes and Noble. And, um, and then if you go onto my website, um, you you could see my trailer and you could see some videos of Frank and me and you can see some interviews I did and you could also see some personal private pictures of Frank and I. Miss Deborah, what's in your heart right now? And is there any specific goals you want to achieve? Um, I would like to, um, of course, be happy again. I just struggle with being happy. Um, my goal is to my goal is to be happy again. Um, I would like to find myself uh, a peaceful place to lay my head um, by the water somewhere. That's the goal for me. Um, a, a vintage house somewhere maybe. Um, you know, I don't know where God has planned for my life and I'm sure it's going to be magnificent because God is in it. So uh, what, what could go wrong? Um, so um, I, I, I hope to be an inspiration to those who struggle with what I struggled with and to know that you don't give up and, um, and keep the faith and, and, and know that God's there and that the grace is there and God's mercy is there. And um, even though you can't feel it, he's there. And, um, and look at what I did. I wrote a book on a million years. I never thought I was going to write it. Never wanted to write a book, um, wrote a book. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback on it. People just, they think, wow, Deborah, that, that's good. Well, congratulations. As someone has told you earlier, the key is love. Yes, and I look forward to that love. Well, we wish you all the best and tons of love. Thank you. To come your way. Thank you. God bless. God bless. Catch me again next week as I feature another amazing personality here on Biggest Vibes.
We hope you enjoyed watching Vegas Vibes episode as much as I did. Promise to join me again next week on this same fabulous Vegas Vibes channel. And to all our global viewers out there, let me remind you that Las Vegas is not just about the world-renowned strip or the famous Fremont Street experience in the vibrant downtown district. It has real people, a lot of them musicians, live entertainers, and those involved in the world of pageantry. And to the people here in the valley who work hard each day to make Las Vegas a global brand. I would like to feature you and your cool story right here in Vegas Vibes, either in the studio or online via Zoom. If you believe that's you, please email me now at VegasVibes1 at gmail.com. Before I go, I would like to thank my wardrobe sponsor, Anne Fontaine, located at the Farm Shops of Caesars Palace. Anne Fontaine is now open for business as well. You may call Ms. Anna Billings at 702-733-6205 to make an appointment. And now for my favorite segment, the Vegas Vibes Closet. Yes, it features an intricate selection of health and beauty products which I personally use. And this week I have for you Alamis Pro Collagen Advanced Eye Treatment. Experience the award-winning anti-aging cream that is giving people the confidence to go makeup free. This super moisturizing yet ultra light gel cream quenches thirsty skin and increases hydration by up to 247% in an hour. Formulated with powerful marine and plant actives including Padina Pavonica, Chlorella, and Ginkgo Biloba. The advanced formula is clinically proven to reduce the look of look of fine lines and wrinkles in two weeks. It also helps to improve the look of firmness and elasticity for skin that looks smooth and rejuvenated. I love Alamis Pro Collagen Advanced Eye Treatment, an anti-wrinkle moisturizer that is clinically proven to improve hydration, leaving my skin looking and feeling firmer and more rigid. Check it out ladies, below is the link if you wish to learn more about it or purchase it without delay. Search for Vegas Vibes Closet. Follow Vegas Vibes on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram or check out VegasVibes.us for updates and announcements. Once again, I'm your host, Esmeralda Padilla-Gold. Thank you for watching. Mwah!